We hope you enjoy the following video presentation sponsored by the C.S. Lewis Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization with a mission to equip and encourage Christians to live their faith within the world of ideas and arts. To help us continue to host events and make videos like this one, please make a donation after viewing the video by going to www.cslewis.org or clicking the link below. Thank you. I was able to play American football till I was 44 years old. I never had a major injury, a couple broken fingers, one concussion, but my mother told me when I was young she didn't want me to play because she thought I would be um, horribly mangled as a result, and I, I, nothing happened, unfortunately. Um, but it's true, the meeting with Adler, my, virtually my life is the life of Forrest Gump. I'm about as intelligent as he is, and, and, I, and I've had these really interesting experiences. And I'll just tell you two real quick ones, if I can, if you'll indulge me this. Um, I was 12 years old, and I was at Disneyland, and Walt Disney was in this parade down Main Street. And uh, my older brother and I were there and we were trying to see Disney but we were small and the crowd was all in front of us and there's a cigar store Indian in front of that little theater on Main Street if you've ever been there you know what I'm talking about so I climbed up on the shoulders of this Indian and my brother was standing on the pedestal and the parade ended about where the sound console thing is back there and there were you know thousands of people around there and and Disney gets out of the car and it wasn't in the day when people would just rush up to somebody. They always gave people their space. And Disney comes walking over towards us. And I'm going, oh, no. I was always in trouble when I was a kid. He's going to be mad at me for sitting on his Indian. <laughs> and instead, he just came over and shook our hands. We had a nice little visit with him. That was interesting. And my brother said to him, gee, Mr. Disney, you look different in real life than you do on TV. And he said to my brother, and you look different, too. And I've never seen you before. <laughs> And then one other quick one. Um, after I became a Christian, the guys who led me to Jesus, they would share Jesus with people. So I didn't know you weren't supposed to. <laughs> so we would go share Jesus with people. And, and whenever there were riots and protests, we, we would be there for these things. And I went to Whittier College. And it wasn't like Stanford where everything's real calm and people are nice and polite and smart. <clears throat> so Whittier College, that was Nixon's alma mater, so we had ABC, CBS, NBC, they were there every week during riot season, and there was a real riot season, and uh, Jane Fonda was there the week after she got back from Hanoi, and Daniel Ellsberg, after he stole the Pentagon Papers, was there about a week later, and all these people were coming through, Barbara Walters came through, and we were there, and so on. So anyway, we heard about this one big riot that was staged at UCLA, and it was because the Board of Regents were going to raise the tuition at the UC schools. Um, and kid, kids came down from, um, from uh, um, uh, Berkeley, Berkeley, thank you, from Santa Barbara. They came up from San Diego, everywhere. They came. There are thousands and thousands of students. And my roommates and I decided we'd go to the riot, see if we could share Jesus with people. Well, they were going to let 40 students into the regents' meeting. That was it, 40 students. And somehow we got in, and we didn't even go to a UC school. <laughs> <clears throat> so they passed out the agenda to everybody, and it said uh, all the things they were going to discuss. And when it said discuss tuition rises, um, right beneath it, it had a comment time for student response. So they had made time for the students to respond to what was going to go on. So the regents come in and Ronald Reagan comes in. And I had had an occasion to meet him a few times in his office for some events. And I actually had worked on his favorite son campaign in Miami, Florida in 68. So I'd met him before, but you know he wouldn't remember me from Adam. But the regents come walking in and the students just erupt with obscenity, screaming, banging their chairs and everything. The moderator gets up and says, we want to hear you students. We want to hear your response. But we have other business to cover. You can see on the agenda we passed out, we've got time scheduled for you to speak and respond. But we have to cover the business. If you disrupt the meeting again, you're out. 
as soon as he said that, the students just start screaming, obscenities, yelling, disrupting the whole thing. So he says, okay, you students are out. So I see the regents go through a door over here. The other students were supposed to go down a hall. I just went through a door by us, and as soon as I go through the door, Reagan's about as close as I am to Dennis. And I go walking up to him. I said, Governor Reagan, I don't know if you remember me or not. I worked on your campaign in Miami, Florida last summer. And since that time, I've become a Christian. I'm here with a bunch of Campus Crusade for Christ people. We're sharing Christ with people. Have you ever heard of the four spiritual laws? <laughs> And, and he put his arm around me, and he looked at me, and he said, you know what, Jerry, I didn't remember your name, but I, I remember your face. And he said, in fact, I, I was discouraged when I came back from Miami, and my pastor, Don Moomau, at Bel Air Presbyterian Church, led me to Christ right after I got back, and I've become a Christian. And I'm going to be up at Arrowhead Springs with a, week of Bible, or a weekend of Bible studies with Bill Bright uh, next month. He said, but i got to get back in this meeting. Look, could you share the four laws with three of my aides in this little room over here? So we were, they were in this room. I met Reagan in this room. And there's this little room over here. So I go in there, and I'm sharing Jesus with the aides. There were no windows in that room, but there were transoms. And by that time, uh, my roommates told me when the students got outside, they said they wouldn't allow free speech. They didn't say, we had a chance to represent you, and we screwed it up because we were obnoxious. They blamed it all on the regents as if something went wrong. I saw the whole thing with my own eyes. So the students rushed the building, and all of a sudden I'm sharing the gospel with these three aides, and <laughs> beer bottles are coming through, the transoms, rocks are coming through, glasses going everywhere, and I'm trying to concentrate on sharing the gospel. Two of the guys get up as if they could do something. The one guy, he was real serious. He sat through the whole thing. And then when he said, I'll go up to Arrowhead Springs with the governor to find out more about this. And just then I come out of the room where I was in the very meeting with uh, Reagan. And, and as I walk out the room, I can see at that end a reporter with the lights on, the cameras rolling. And I hear him say right when I come out of the room, we do know there was one student who was able to talk to the governor. And, <laughs> and all the light people and the camera people are pointing. And so he turns around real quick and says, there he is. What was it that you said to the governor? And I start sharing Jesus on this live newscast. And the guy wanted to kink the hose, but there was nothing he could do about it, you know? Isn't that fun? I... I'm Forrest Gump. I'm basically <laughs> Forrest Gump. <laughs> and I, I have a million other stories like that. But the thing is, though, you know, we live these lives and God has called us to follow him. And there's an awful lot of excitement if we take advantage of opportunities that are around us on every side. And I kind of like that. But we need to get into more serious topics. Let's talk about... <laughs> the abolition of man. But let me pray first, if I can. Gracious Lord, thank you for uh, the opportunities that are around us. I, I worship you for the unique way you made each person in this room. I, 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 I kind of want to get inside of the delight you took when you chose the DNA pieces and chose the history, and chose the family of origin, um, complexities from which each person came. Because you had purposes and plans. We know creation implies intention. And you had intention for each person here. I pray that you would let each person here take delight in the fact that you enjoyed making them, and that you wanted them. And I pray, Father, as we look at the abolition of man and we consider some of the realities and what you're calling us to do to follow you, not just to have our longings awakened and directed toward you, the object of our deepest longing, but where we seek to con conform the, our souls to reality as well, to make us different, because we, we desperately want the brokenness fixed, and we want to be more like your son. So as we think about this tonight and tomorrow morning especially, give us grace. In your name we pray. Amen. Um, Lewis um, says at the beginning of the, the uh, in his preface to the, that hideous strength, that um, this is a tall story about devilry. Uh, though it ha has behind it a serious point, which I have tried to make in my abolition of man. 
And we also recognize that um, he not only calls us to direct our desires towards him, to have them awakened through life's experiences, he also wants us to hear the imperious call to reality whereby we conform our souls to reality. In the abolition of man, he actually wrote it this way. For the wise men of old, the cardinal problem had been how to conform the soul to reality. And the solution had been knowledge, self-discipline, and virtue. So what is the argument of this book? We'll look at its application to that hideous strength tomorrow morning. But I want to look at the argument itself. Uh, Lewis was an objectivist. Um, I don't want you to confuse that with an Enlightenment rationalist. There's a big difference. And objectivism goes way, way further back than Enlightenment rationalism. And it's less pretentious, too. He believed in knowers. That is, subjects, people who could know. And he believed in things to be known, objects both material and objects of thought. Ideas introduced by definition from which inferences might arise and understanding develop. Lewis was no relativist. A truth claim necessitated some object, material or thought, to support the claim. Matter of fact, one time he was in the Socratic Club at Oxford University. Um, uh, I mentioned uh, this morning when I was uh, uh, referring to Steve and I being in the St. Hilda's uh, Junior Common Room where Lewis debated uh, Anscombe, Elizabeth Anscombe. But once in the Socratic Club, there was a relativist who stood up and was chiding Lewis and giving him a hard time. And he says to Lewis, how do you know there isn't a blue cow sitting on the piano right now? And Lewis said to him, well, in, in what sense blue? <laughs> if you don't have anything to refer to, then you're not going to be able to solve that problem. Truth is not reality. Truth is what I think about reality when I think accurately about it. Lewis wrote, truth is always about something, but reality is that about which truth is. And without some sort of object of thought or material object, you can't correct a false notion, nor can you support a true one. You can have opinions about it, probabilities, but probabilities are subject to doubt and reasonable people could differ about them. But when it comes to matters of truth, where they're supported either by this object of thought or the material object, there's, there's no dispute. You've got something to appeal to. We could go deeper with our understanding of that object. That's okay. I'll give you an example. I, I, my office is in the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College. And I went into the bathroom one time. And I was in the stall. And I was doing what I needed to do. And I heard somebody come into the bathroom. A couple minutes later, I finished up what I needed to do, and I came out, and there's a woman standing at the mirror, and she's fixing her makeup. And she saw me in the bathroom coming out of the stall, and she turns to me, and she starts berating me for being in the women's bathroom. Now, clearly, we have a conceptual disagreement, in our, a, dif a difference in our conceptual framework. How are we going to resolve this? Well, the argument was one word. I pointed and said, urinals. <laughs> and she looked at that and she ran out of the room, screaming. Her view was wrong, and the way we demonstrated that her view was wrong was there was something that did not correspond to her framework. If I deny objective reality as a means to confirm or deny the truth or falsehood of any claim that might be made, then I am left with mere subjectivism, the subject disoriented and disassociated from any objective reality. I become self-referential, and I will probably move towards becoming utilitarian in my relationships. When the self-referential achieve power, they create tyrannies. In an essay called The Poison of Subjectivism, Lewis wrote, One cause of misery and vice is always present with us in the greed and pride of men. But at certain periods in history, this, greatly, this is greatly increased by the temporary prevalence of some false philosophy. Correct thinking will not make good men of bad ones, but a purely theoretical error may remove ordinary checks to evil and deprive good intentions of their natural support. An error of this, of this sort is abroad at present. I am not referring to the power of philosophies of the totalitarian states, but to something that goes deeper and spreads wider 
and which indeed has given these power philosophies their golden opportunity, I am referring to subjectivism. Later that same year, Lewis turned his essay, The Poison of Subjectivism, into the book, The Abolition of Man, where he develops these themes in, in, in more depth. The occasion and influence of the book was such that Lewis had received a grammar book for sixth form. That would be equivalent of our 11th and 12th grade school in America. And he was asked if he might write a review. I mean, I don't think that his review would have sold as many books as Oprah's endorsement, but nevertheless, um, his review would be helpful to the sale of a book. The book was titled The Control of Language. It was by Alec King and Martin Ketley. And not wanting to embarrass the authors, Lewis simply referred to it as the Green Book and the authors as Gaia Sentitious. He sees subjectivism embedded in the book on virtually every page. And so he wants to prevent something like this book that's inculcating false philosophies into people's minds under the guise of romance. His abolition of man created quite a stir. In his letters to an American lady, he didn't think people were responding to the book much. But in reality, it had created quite a stir. If you read B.F. Skinner's Beyond Freedom and Dignity, there's two chapters where he's dialoguing virtu virtually with Lewis. And when Skinner uses the term conditioner, he gets it from chapter 3 of The Abolition of Man. Mortimer Adler, honoring the wisdom of Lewis's book included in the great books of the Western world, that is, he categorized it with books like Plato and Homer, Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, Pascal, and so on. Uh, Lewis thought it along with Perlandra Until We Have Faces were his three best books. Furthermore, if any student of Lewis wants to grasp the core of his rational approach to thought, that student must study this book. And I want to set forth the argument of the book, evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of the argument, and then apply the argument to this idea of adjusting the scoliosis of our soul to reality. So the argument, basically, if I can spell it out, is that Lewis begins in chapter 1 by talking about um, um, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge being at a waterfall. How many of you have read The Abolition of Man? So you know the passage in. Uh, Coleridge was at a waterfall. And I, it was a well-known story of Coleridge at the waterfall. How many of you ever heard about that story independent of this book? It took me 15 years to find it. I was asking Oxford uh, 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 academics, where is the well-known story of Coleridge at the waterfall? I don't know. I've never heard of it. I thought maybe it would be like George Washington chopping down the cherry tree or something <laughs> like that. Finally, I found it. It's in the Grasmere Journals of Dorothy Wordsworth, William Wordsworth's sister, 1803. It was a trip that they took together, Dorothy and William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and they went to the Coralin Waterfall. I've been there to see it. I want to see it myself. It's a spectacular waterfall. It kind of cascades like stairs down. And, and, and it's, it's on the River Clyde. And Coleridge was there looking at the waterfall, We'll see if we can get some impression of this waterfall here. And there were two tourists at the waterfall. And as the tourists were looking at the waterfall, one of them called it pretty. The other one called it sublime. You have a, a platonic ideal of waterfallness. This waterfall approximates that better than anything I've ever seen. This is sublime. The other one says pretty. Neither of them were saying anything negative about the waterfall. And Coleridge mentally endorses the one who said sublime. It's thought that that was a more appropriate statement, that it was actually closer to a descriptive term. It was uh, closer to the objective reality. Well, Gaius and Titius, in reporting the story, basically say Coleridge had no right to make that judgment. For these two weren't saying anything about the waterfall. They were only saying something about their own feelings. And feelings don't have to be connected to any kind of objective reality. And basically what they did was they severed the object from the knower. 
and disassociating them, they end up in a kind of intellectual anarchy. Okay? Well, the irony about this whole thing is that when Gaius and Titius say Coleridge had no right to make that judgment, they are making a judgment. And when they make that judgment, they are basically making a judgment where they have already said the objects don't matter. There's the subjectivism again. I, I remember when I was in college, um, when Jane Fonda came to Wheaton, I, I, Whittier, Whittier College, I used to never tell her name, but I, you know she became a Christian. I don't know if you read her testimony in her book. And I read it, and I think she's got some goofiness in her life. But I think she became a real Christian when I read her testimony. It was very convincing to me. And I'm a Christian, and I have a lot of goofiness in my life. So I don't want you to judge me by my goofiness. But I wouldn't tell the story, but I tell it now, because I know that that was then, and this is now, and things have changed. But she got up uh, to speak at the Harris Amphitheater at Whittier College. And she told us all to write to our friends in Vietnam and tell them to frag their officers. To frag your officer meant if your officer was in a tent, you'd roll a hand grenade in their tent while they were sleeping and kill them. Or if you were on an attack, you'd shoot them in the back so that they would die. And if we could kill all the officers, we'd have to come home and it would end the war. When I heard this, I, I was furious, absolutely furious about this. Uh, my friend Wayne Martindale, with whom I did the quotable Lewis, he was an officer of Vietnam. His best friend in Vietnam was killed by fragging. Another friend of his was injured so badly he had to come home. And Martindale one time was supposed to lead a convoy. And just before the convoy pulled out, they found hand grenades with the clips pulled in the necks of every one of the vehicles in that convoy. And he thinks the guy who found the hand grenades was the guy who put them in and then got assigned to the convoy. But he wasn't ever able to prove it. I go to a philosophy class right after hearing uh, Jane Fonda say this. And I, I, I was so angry. I got there early. Uh, it was one of those tiered classrooms. Only one guy was in there. And I'm going back and forth. How could she say that? I can't believe this makes, makes me so angry. She says, we shouldn't be in Vietnam killing for peace. And then she's telling us all to go kill for peace or advise our friends to kill for peace. And I'm so angry and so on. And finally, this guy sitting in the class says, well, that's a value judgment on your part. Well, the cardinal sin in the college campus at that time was making value judgments. And I go, yeah, that was a value judgment. Wow, I don't want to do that. And I sit down in the chair. And then I looked at this guy and I said, yeah, but when you said that was a value judgment, that was a value judgment too. So what makes your value judgment any better than mine? And I'm just with Coleridge at the waterfall. How do you make any kind of judgment about anything if there isn't an objective val value or some sort of objective standard by which you can make the judgment? And so Lewis basically says that this is dangerous stuff if we cut ourselves off from any kind of objective reality or any attempt to try to understand that objective reality. Um, Gaius and Titius said that Coleridge had no right to make the, uh, such a judgment uh, for the tourists were not saying anything about the waterfall, but only something about their own feelings. And Lewis recognizes that even feelings should be corresponding to some kind of reality. Not just thoughts and ideas. If, if you're, if you're um, at a birthday party and you're morose, you're spoiling in that birthday party for the people who are there. Those are not feelings that are appropriate to that event. If you're on your way to the birthday party and you got a cell phone call that one of your good friends just was hurt in an accident, naturally you feel sad and that's appropriate to the phone call and probably a wise thing for you to do would be to call ahead and tell your friends something's come up and you can't come to the party so you're not a spoiler for them and you can deal with your sadness. If you're at a funeral and you're giddy and happy, then that's inappropriate for that event. There's not an objective reality that supports the emotional state unless you owe the guy a lot of money or something like that. <laughs> but, but that would be related to something different here. And Lewis is saying our emotional states can be in harmony even with reality as well. Until quite modern times, he wrote, all teachers and even all men believe that the universe to be such that certain emotional reactions on our part could be either congruous or incongruous to it. 
believed in fact that objects do not merely receive but can merit our approval or disapproval, our reverence or our contempt. The reason why Coleridge agreed with the tourists who called the cataract sublime and disagreed with the one who called it pretty was of course that he believed inanimate nature to be such that certain responses could be more just or ordinate or appropriate to it than others. And he believed correctly that the tourists thought the same. For judgments to have validity and meaning, they must be tethered to reality. Otherwise, they become anarchistic, relativistic, and so forth. And Lewis wrote, the right defense against false sentiments is to inculcate just sentiments. By starving the sensibility of our pupils, we only make them easier prey to the propagandist when he comes. For famished nature will be avenged, and a hard heart is no infallible protection against a soft head. At this point, Lewis introduces a word in the book, the word, the Tao, or you could say Tao if you prefer. He uses this as a shorthand and defines it this way. The Tao is the doctrine of objective value, the belief that certain things are really true and others really false to the kind of thing we are and the kind of thing the universe is. And he introduces this particular word and he gives different examples. Can you be just, says Thomas Traherne, unless you render to a thing its due? And then he talks about um, Augustine, uh, who refers to ordo amorous, ordered loves, giving to a thing its appropriate devotion, and so on. And in the midst of all of this, Lewis finally says, if we give up on objective value, we're going to have crisis for our culture. He writes at the end of that chapter, chapter 1, and all the time, such as the tragic comedy of our situation, we continue to clamor for those very qualities we are rendering impossible because we've separated them from any kind of objective reality. You can hardly open a periodical without coming across the statement, what our civilization needs is more drive or dynamism or self-sacrifice or creativity. In a sort of ghastly simplicity, we remove the organ and demand the function. We make men without chests or emotion and expect of them virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the geldings be fruitful. In the second chapter of that book, Lewis goes on to say, but if the authors of the Green Book are making judgments, then they must believe that there's something that renders validity to their particular judgment. What is it? And Lewis is just guessing, and he says, well, maybe it's something like this. He says, maybe it's utilitarian value, that which is the greatest good for the greatest number. But who determines which number get the greatest, and who determines who gets to make sacrifices for the greatest number? And all of a sudden, without any kind of transcendent value, you can do all kinds of horrible things once a majority gets into power. He says, well, maybe they could use instinct. But Lewis says instincts say all different sorts of things, and every instinct demands to be taken care of at the expense of the others. You're taking a class at school, your approach to education is, is, is kind of utilitarian, and consequently, um, you, you goofed off, and you didn't get that paper done, and it's getting towards the deadline. And yet you feel like you need a good grade on your transcript so that you can um, get a better job and make a lot of money and take care of yourself economically. So consequently, the paper's due Monday morning and you start Saturday night and you know you're going to have to pull a couple back-to-back -back all-nighters. So you're just pumping the coffee through the night. You're skipping meals. You're hungry. You're tired. You get the tape paper typed up, and it's Monday morning time for the deadline, and now you've got several things going on, and your instincts are crying out. The desire for sleep, the desire for food, the desire to take care of your bladder, and the desire to get the paper in so that you could get the better job so that you could go on and make more money than everybody else. Which one do you satisfy first? Because there's no instinct that transcends the instincts that tells you what instinct you need to satisfy. There's an arbitrariness to us. I know what I would do. I'd probably run to the bathroom first. <laughs> then if I'd spent all that time working on the paper and not turning it in, that was a waste. So I'd run and turn in the paper as quick as I could. And then I suppose it's a, a, you know, one, one thing or the other. Do you go sleep and eat later or do you eat first and then sleep? 
But nevertheless, Lewis says instincts don't have enough in them to give us a sense of what might be right. Then, then Lewis suggests, well, maybe it's economic value. You know, maybe it could be that. And, and, and Lewis shows in this chapter that that, that doesn't work either. Ultimately, um, we can't come up with the mere quest to make money for some sort of morality that will rule over how we make that money and what we do with that money once we make it. And so Lewis sees these particular problems in chapter 2 as he spells this out. And he moves on then to chapter 3. In chapter 3, he basically says that if we reject the Tao, man's conquest over nature without transcending moral principles to guide, will become the conquest of some men over others. It will become man's conquest over man, and man himself will be the loser. Lewis writes, either we are rational spirit obliged forever to obey the absolute values of the Tao, or else we are mere nature to be kneaded and cut into new shapes for the pleasures of masters who must, by hypothesis, have no motive but their own natural impulses. Only the Tao provides a common, Human law of action, which can overrock rulers and rule the like. A dogmatic belief in objective value is necessary to the very idea of a rule which is not tyranny or an obedience which is not slavery. After that chapter, Lewis then gives an appendix, and in the appendix, he gives quote after quote after quote from sources from the East, from sources from the West, from sources from the past, from sources from the Middle Ages, from sources that are relatively contemporary, just to show that from time immemorial, people have understood this thing about the correspondence between um, uh, the subjective response to the objective. This is going to be hard. My wrestling coach said he didn't think I could walk and chew gum at the same time. It's going to be hard to hold this and talk. I'm not used to it. But anyway, um, so I want to evaluate Lewis's argument, and then I want to apply it to this idea of adjusting the scoliosis of the soul to reality. First off, the, the evaluation. Uh, Richard Weaver, the rhetorician, University of Chicago, he wrote the book uh, many people know as Ideas Have Consequences. He wrote a sequel to it, The Ethics of Rhetoric. And in this particular book, The Ethics of Rhetoric, he defines four types of ethical arguments. The most ethical argument he calls um, the, <clears throat> the argument from definition. He thinks this is the most ethical because I'm appealing to something, some object of thought or whatever. But the problem with the argument from definition is um, there are some things that are a little bit outside the purview. The word definition means of the finite, of that which has ends. Uh, to define anything, it has to be small enough for us to wrap words around it and distinguish it. The purse from the chair, from the man, from the podium, so on. Um, so this works fine if I can get to the object of reality, whether it be the object of thought or the material object. But what if I can't? What if I'm going to talk about God? He breaks a category because God is not finite. So he talks about the argument from similitude. It's like this. Um, the medieval um, uh, scholastic theologians, they would talk about um, uh, the way of analogy when they would speak about God. Jesus, when he wants to refer to the kingdom of heaven, he says the kingdom of heaven is like. He uses similitude and so on. It's the second best. When I can't get to this, this is, this is not bad. But the third one is the argument from consequence. And this, he believes, is the least ethical form of argument. Um, it, it, it's the kind of thing we're going to be hearing with greater and greater frequency during the uh, uh, political season that's coming up. If you vote for my opponent in this next election, the whole country is going to go to hell in a handbasket. Well, there's no reality to support the claim. I don't know what's going to happen in the future for sure. So consequently, if I begin to use that kind of rhetoric, I'm trying to create in you, the voter, fear. And if I create fear in you, I can manipulate you and maybe get you to vote for me because you don't want those consequences that will happen. 
And, and we've seen it in plenty of elections. I remember when President Clinton was running for president. And people said, if you vote for President Clinton, all you're going to have is change in your pocket. It's gonna, the whole economy is going to go bad. Well, we all live the history, and our economy didn't go bad. So there was the, the challenge before he ran, and there was the result after. So we have to be careful of these things. And then the fourth type of argument is he doesn't assign a moral value to it, but this is the argument from authority, and this is when I don't know how to argue, so I just quote somebody else or produce a book like the quotable C.S. Lewis or something like this. <laughs> okay, so if I looked at the abolition of man even for the weight of that book itself, interestingly enough, the chapters and sections fall in this order. The best chapter in the book is the argument from definition, by far. The argument about the Tao in that first chapter. Um, he says, okay, if Gaius and Titius are going to make judgments, maybe they make judgments for reasons like this. And it's an argument from similitude. And then, chapter 3, he says, if we reject the Tao, the whole world's going to go to hell in a handbasket. And in fact, maybe it will, maybe it won't. And so, it's an argument from consequence. It's the weakest chapter of that book. Now, he will do something like this in that hideous strength. But it's a different deal. It's a different uh, a cat because this is something he wants to portray imaginatively and he's not universalizing a judgment from the imaginative depiction. I don't know about you guys. I love NPR radio. But if you listen to NPR, they're great storytellers. Plus, if you want to hear Garrison Keillor, that's where you got to go. But this is the problem with NPR radio. They'll tell a sad story. A boy, five years old, he has, he has 20 seizures a day, and the only thing that gets him by is if he eats muffins laced with hemp. Therefore, everybody should be eating muffins laced with hemp. And as soon as you begin to universalize the judgment, you've got some problems. You've got to stick to the definition before you make the judgment. Anyway, so Lewis has this consequence chapter in chapter 3. And then lastly, he has the appendix. and the appendix, he's just basically setting forth bunches of authority. I think his argument runs like this, and I think we can judge his argument accordingly. But nevertheless, this is compelling and needs to be dealt with. And now I want to make some applications. <clears throat> Application of making judgments. How, how does it work? for art and beauty in De Futilitate, an essay that uh, he wrote of futility. Um, he says in this that not only can we make judgments about moral choices by virtue of the Tao that could be sound, he says also we can make judgments in art and beauty and things like this. And it would stand to reason that in fact, if there is an objectivity to beauty and there's a subjective response, this would be possible, but how is it done? In Reflections on the Psalm, C.S. Lewis says, there is that which he calls admirable beauty. That's beauty intrinsic to an object, whether I see it or not. And secondly, there is enjoyable beauty, my capacity to appreciate the beauty that's in that object. So the subject and object is still working. If, in fact, there is some objective beauty in the thing, and I might not see it, expert opinion, those who have trained to understand these things, those particular people um, can benefit me. For example, as soon as I shout it out, I want you to give me the answer to the question. How many squares do you see there? You guys are murmuring. Huh? 16? 21? 25? Even more? All right, now look at this. You are all looking at an object, and none of you are coming up with the same answer, and I haven't heard any of you give the right answer. Yes? I can see, Andrew, how that might have thrown you off. But remember, I was a PE major in college. You have to cut me some slack. All right. Uh, the answer is 30 squares. 16 little ones, one big one. That's 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 
25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Okay, I'm not an expert on very much, but I'm an expert on the 30 squares. And so I was able to show you something that you hadn't seen before. Why would we not believe that on matters of painting and art and so on? I, I remember one time I said to my wife, she, she had just taken a course on Picasso. And I said to her, oh, Claudia, Picasso's an idiot. She said, really? What do you know about Picasso, Jerry? And I had to admit I didn't know anything. She says, okay, the first thing we have to do is reevaluate who the idiot is here. <laughs> and then after doing that, we're going to see if the idiot is educable. <clears throat> they had a big Picasso exhibit at the Chicago Art Institute. We went down there. She explained to me some things. And I go, oh, my heavens. I spoke way too soon. Years later, we went to Barcelona, Spain. We went to the Picasso Museum in Barcelona, and it took my breath away. How often we make judgments about things we don't know anything about, and somebody who knows about it, if they're patient enough with us, if we've been as obnoxious as I had been in that situation, maybe we can learn something and benefit from it. Okay, so if this objectivity of beauty exists, then, then what is it? What can we know about it? And um, Thomas Aquinas in the Summa Theologica, he gives us three things that we can look for that can help us start to make a judgment about beauty. If there's three, there could be 3,000 and three, but three is a starting point, right? So the first thing is he says there must be integrity. Integrity, all right? So when you go to buy a Christmas tree at the lot, which tree do you buy? Do you buy that one? Or do you buy the one on the left or the one on the right? You have an idea. Yeah, if you have to buy. <coughs> what'd you say? The, <laughs> no, it's a doll. It's a Salvador dolly. Yeah. If you buy the one on the left, that, that's probably the one you're going to select. If you buy the one on the right because it's the last one on the lot, you say, well, we'll turn that towards the wall or something like that. You have an idea of Christmas tree nests. I don't know if you're an Aristotelian and you've seen thousands of examples and you've generalized from those examples and that's how you came up with the definition, but you have an idea of tree nests and you want something that has integrity. Or else maybe Plato was right and it's all come down and you've had it intuitively and you look for this thing. That's not even the issue at play here. The issue at play is this is probably the one you buy because it has integrity. But, 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 but all of a sudden, um, people can do things with this integrity and show us angles that we wouldn't have ever considered before. And a good artist will sometimes do that. And it, it will be very, very helpful to us, this idea of integrity. Um, another thing that we can do is, uh, as a matter of fact, how many of you have seen Marcel Duchamp's Nude Descending a Staircase? It's one of my favorite paintings of all time. It doesn't look anything like a nude. What did he capture in that painting? What's the integrity of that painting? Movement, the descent, the descent. It's unbelievable how he did this. And so we always have to be careful. What are the, what's the artist trying to portray? What does the artist see that we haven't seen yet? And we stay inclined to it and we benefit. Okay, after integrity, the next thing that we read about is proportion. 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 Okay, I remember when I was in uh, first grade, and we had to do the All About Me. Diana, weren't we talking about the All About Me book? Do you guys, did you guys do that in first grade? So the first picture was me. And I just drew a big, big head on the front page. There was no more room for anything else. I took up every inch of the space. Next page, I had to drive, draw my mother and father, and they took up half a page each. The next page, I had to draw my siblings, and they were like little ants on the page. <laughs> A little self-referential, probably. The next thing I had to do, it, uh, the teacher said, draw something you like. So I drew an airplane. I go to the teacher. I say, teacher, I'm done. I'm done. Uh, she says, Jerry, there's more time. Draw something else. So I drew three airplanes. I wasn't very creative. <laughs> then I go, teacher, I'm done. I'm done. Draw something else. She said, Jerry, there's still more time. So I went to the room, and I said, time. That's what I'll do. Oops. Yeah, there's your dolly right there. 
It looks something like that. No, no proportion. It's a, bad, it's a bad drawing. And yet, on the other hand, here comes Picasso, and he does this painting. Right there. And it, it's, it's somebody sitting down. But the thing about it is, he just has a line way out on the edge. And he lets you, almost gestalt-like, fill in the blank. And he's done something very creative with that. And, and, and it's amazing, with minimal effort. So it's not always going to be the way we expect, but nevertheless, uh, uh, integrity, proportion, the last one's clarity. What kind of day do you prefer? Do you prefer the day where it's a sheet of gray cloud over the sky? You might in, in Illinois if spring's popping out and you've had a, a horrible winter and all of a sudden it rivets your attention to all the color that the earth is bearing uh, around you. It's glorious. But generally we wouldn't say we like a sheet of gray cloud. Matter of fact, generally we would say we would prefer something different even than just a sheet of blue sky. All of a sudden, if we can start getting clouds in that sky, and then maybe we could see the sunward side of the cloud looking like a ribbon of gold, and then just beyond that, this brilliant white, and then it drifting into colors like ivory and dove and gray. Or better yet, maybe we get a sky at a sunset, and we see all the orange and the apricot and, and the magenta all on a blue canvas with this golden sun shining. It takes our breath away. Uh, it's the brightness and color that turns our attention that direction. And so that's the way that uh, a Lewisian understanding would apply to art. But what about character? What about character? And Lewis talks about the fact that we want to conform the soul to reality. We want to cultivate virtue. And what does that look like? It's something I'm going to talk about tomorrow morning because in that hideous strength, we've got two people caught in the balances, Mark and Jane Studdock. And they're going to have to conform themselves to reality or to falsehood. And we want to see what that's going to look like. And we want to learn from it as we apply then the argument of the abolition of man to a story and see how Lewis depicts it in the story that we might looking at it knowing that it's not reality per se but it's a depiction that allows us to begin to see mirrored back in that depiction something of our own character and our own struggle along the way so we'll see that tomorrow and now questions